Like Chris said, um, my name is Amanda Wilkins. I'm the garden curator at Juniper Level Botanic Garden. And if y'all have not been down to visit us, we're in South Raleigh. If you've been to Plant Delights Nursery, we're all the gardens around all the crazy buildings out there. Um, and we will eventually be a sister institution to the J.C. Ralston Arboretum within the next 10 years, I imagine. Um, so we're very, very excited about that. Um, before I was a garden curator, um, I was. I did, got my undergrad degree from NC State, so go pack. Um, and before that, I was, what have I been here, Chris? I believe I've been an intern, mm -hmm. I've been a volunteer, I've given lectures, I've taught a class or two. Do go to the, in, the, um, the intern uh, walk this week, so ne this week or next week? July 2nd. July 2nd, go. It's really good practice for them and ask good questions because they have to do all the research on their plants that they're going to give you. I remember the one that I remembered, I gave mine on chimeric plants, and I, taught, I, I talked about a, a Canna Cleopatra and what a chimera is. Um, anyway, so I got my undergrad degree from NC State in, uh, in December 2013. And from there, I, um, I've gone uh, in four years of travel since then. Uh, I went to Martha's Vineyard. And then I went down to Mobile, Alabama, and I was the garden curator at the Mobile Botanical Gardens for about eight months because my first day I found out that I was going to Scotland to do my master's at the University of Edinburgh, the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh. I said, thanks for the job, guys, but I'm going to be gone in August. Um, but they were very kind and let me do what I could for them. And so I went up to Edinburgh for about a year and a half and where I did my master's, which was a very intensive um, nine to five kind of job. Um, and then I came back to the Mobile Botanical Gardens as the curator. Um, and I was there for a year and a half uh, before I got homesick and said, I'm going back to North Carolina. And Tony Avent was kind enough to go, okay, I'll offer you a job. <laughs> and so here I am. And so uh, I didn't explain this the last time I gave my talk and hopefully I will finish, but um, this is the tartan of the University of Edinburgh. And it's kind of a, a theme since the um, early 1700s. It really wasn't a thing in Scotland before then. Um, there was this huge surge of, of country pride, of pride in the country about that time because that was when they were starting to talk to England about signing the, you know, you're going to join the United Kingdom, and they got a bit, um, they got a bit proud of themselves, and the, the clans started, well, how do we represent ourselves? And so I know a lot of y'all have told me that you have um, family in Scotland, and you've got your tartan, and you know, you know what family you come from, and what your your motto is, um, Maclean. Virtue mine honor. Um, uh, but honestly, I'm really sorry, guys, but the colors mean nothing. They mean what you want them to mean. They pick different colors for how they're feeling, really. Um, so it's, it's a hodgepodge, but it does eventually become meaningful because it is what you associate with. So I know a lot of people are very proud of their tartan and it's how they represent their pride in their clan. So my pride in my clan, a horticulture, is plants. And I took a lot of really pretty pictures. Um, so I, I'm going to show you my tartan. Um, so this is a map of the United Kingdom. Um, uh, and then you can see there's Ireland. Um, I didn't know before I was in high school that there was a difference in Ireland between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Um, it's a huge difference and a lot of bad things <coughs> happened. Um, but there is kind of the line between Scotland and England. And of course, Wales is this really sad a little bit down here. Um, <laughs> bless them, bless them. Um, so here's a little bit of a representation of where we're going to go today. We spent a lot of time kind of in here last time. Um, we, we stayed mainly in Edinburgh. Um, Scotland is not very large. It's like half the size of, of the North Carolina. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Um, so to draw, like, but it takes three times as long to get from tip to tip. Um, so I, got, I arrived there in August 2015 um, during what I didn't realize was called the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Um, <laughs> and after having lived there, uh, I realized what a big deal that was, but I got on the double-decker bus from the airport and went, oh my god, look at this! Um, so the reason I had actually gone was um, when I was 13, my grandparents uh, took me and my eight-year-old cousin on a two-week trip to Scotland because my grandmother is a Hannock, which is from the south of Scotland, and she's like, I'm going to show my, my grandchildren where our families are from. And so we, we, we went, and I just I had to get back. Um, and so I, I was going up the mound, and this is the mound. This uh, the castle is kind of over here. 
um, because I was going to look for where I was living at the University of Edinburgh and come to find out that was my kitchen window right there. <laughs> it was a little bit off, but it's right there. Um, thankfully, it was on the first floor, which is really the second floor, and that was the view out of my kitchen window. So there's some context. I walked into my flat and went, <gasps> oh my gosh. Um, so this is the Firth of Forth, which is just a, the sound of Forth of the Forth River, which runs from over here to over there to the North Sea. That is the Kingdom of Fife. It is the Kingdom of Fife. Do not say anything different. Is it a kingdom? Um, and this is in the castles right here. Uh, so that was my little room. It's very cute. Um, you know, university housing in a closet. It's pretty good. Um, and that was the view out of my window. That was the camera obscura there. If you've ever been to Edinburgh and have been you know, wandering up towards the castle, that's the camera obscura. I guess you can see into my room. So I did have people with binoculars. And I'd wave and they'd go, oh God. Um, but I distinctly <laughs> remember this lovely, um, there's a lovely Japanese maple here, which is like, oh my gosh, there's Japanese maple in Edinburgh. This is so cool. And then this lovely ane anemone, which was in full flower when I showed up. And uh, come to find out, we have some at Plant Delights called It's Dreaming Swan. So I have a real soft spot for that plant because uh, I spent a lot of time staring at it. Um, but this was my neighbor, Edinburgh Castle. It was really nice to be able to pop up <coughs> after having looked at plants for too long and go look at the scenery. And this was the view from the Esplanade. Um, very old. This is the, this is old town. Um, that is that was built in the 1200s, y'all. It's just old, so old. Um, in the Pentlands. <coughs> a really nice view at night. So, but I did go there for my master's, which I don't really feel like I talked about a lot when I was, when I gave my present last time, but this was our walk to, walk to school every day. Uh, this is the science building at the Royal Botanic <coughs> Garden in Edinburgh. And, and if you've not been to the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh, and you've been to Scotland, or you're going to Scotland, and you need somewhere to go, this is a place. It's off of three bus lines. It's super accessible. It's free to the public. They do accept donations. And they do a lot of scientific research, some really great outreach material there. And so I spent a lot of time looking at plants under microscopes um, and doing dissections. We did a lot of line drawings um, and picking plants apart and learning. You, know, you never really learn about a plant until you pick it apart and go, oh, you smell terrible. <laughs> um, it's a very, you know, you know your, your sense of smell is jogs, nothing jogs your memory with a sense of smell. And this particular Aristolochia really smelled bad and I had the misfortune of like rubbing my nose after having touched it and my nose went tingly for a moment and I was like okay I'll never forget you Dutchman's pipe though if anybody's got that growing in your garden this is this is like 50 times larger than anything we can grow um, but I spent an entire year and a half with these lovely group of people uh, learning all sorts of things about plants we had representation from um, several different countries from almost every corner of the world including um, China and um, Patagonia, so we're far-flung folk. Um, a lot of people, this was the first time they'd ever seen a Victoria lily, um, and, and a lot of them just did not know what to think. Uh, this is at the Royal Botanic Garden and in the glass houses. Um, but what I did my master's on, besides like going to all these beautiful places, which we will see in the rest of my presentation, um, I did actually do a master's thesis. Um, we, we had to take classes, and then we had, a, we had three months to do research and write a paper. My paper was 93 pages long. Mm. And um, what I was trying to do was put a, an economic value on the trees of the collections in the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh using different value calculators. And so I would walk through the garden and go, oh, aren't these, picture, aren't these plants pretty? And let me measure them. Um, and so I did actually get to measure. This is one of the oldest trees in the garden. Um, this was planted on this rock in 1912. This is the rock garden at the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh. And it's a pine, and I use four different calculators to, c to calculate what it's worth. You know, obviously it is priceless because it was planted there in, a hunt in 1912, and there is no way to replace that plant in that given amount of given time. But they were very interested in trying to communicate value of collections, and so I got to present um, to to actually the uh, the gardener or the the gardener Regis, which is the king gardener. He's the CEO of the garden. It's pretty cool. The Regis King. Um, but uh, the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh is it's the site of a lot of different learning um, opportunities and um, I am going to focus a little bit on this lady here because um, 
Hannah Wilson was in my program. She was also the only other horticulturist in my program, so we got along really well. She was also the only other person in the program, not just woman, but person in the, garden, in the program, who loved scotch. So <laughs> we could go look at plants and drink scotch, and it was great. Um, uh, but this is her and her lovely fiance right here. She is not only an amazing person doing her PhD now at the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh, she is presenting during Gardener's Question Time with the, one of the Gardener's Question Time people and teaching people on the radio how to propagate rhododendrons. Um, and rhododendrons were her um, specialty. But given that she was a horticulturist from Yorkshire, she drug me around the country because she could drive. Um, <laughs> so which was wonderful because I never drove while I was there. Um, and we traveled all over. This is the Scottish Rock Garden Society's spring show in Dunblane, which is a lovely little town. And it has this lovely pub uh, with gluten-free fish and chips. We also both had a gluten allergy, so it was just lovely to travel together. Um, I was like, Hannah, you have to, you have to pose for this picture because we're both so happy we can eat fish and chips finally. Um, notice the mushy peas? I love mushy peas. Um, but we traveled all over looking at rhododendrons across, uh, across Scotland. This is her posing. We had gone on the Azalea Species Society's um, spring trip, and I thought it was lovely the indumentum, which the fuzzy part on the underside of the leaf, matched her sweater. Um, it was amazing. I was like, Hannah, 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 you have to, you have to pose. But there's also the flower. So like, that's the flower color, and that's the underside. I was like, can I get cuttings? Can I get them back into the United States? Will it grow in North Carolina? Um, and trees get a lot bigger there. You know, I'm from, I'm from North Carolina, and you know, we get our lovely oaks and. You know, stuff is stuff gets big, and I, I'm, uh, it's very green. But nothing is as green and big as, as things in Scotland. So there's Hannah right there, um, posing with this Calisedrus decurrens, which is also one of my favorite conifers. Um, so these just lovely views from the, the cars. We're coming home. Um, this is uh, Glenmore, which is one of the highest peaks in, in Scotland, covered in snow even in the end of May. And uh, it wouldn't, I would be remiss if, uh, if you go to Scotland, you do have to go to a garden shop. Um, you know, we have garden centers here in the United States, but a garden shop in the UK is not the same as a garden shop in the United States. I would say Logan's kind of get, gets kind of close to a UK garden center, and that's an entire day-long experience. But these guys, no offense, they, it's a whole nother level. Um, I could not help but love this wall of wellies. Um, and you have to go to get tea first. You can't go walk around the garden, you have to get your tea. And every time, without a doubt, we would have to get tea and cake. Because nine times out of 10, they also had gluten-free cake, which we also love. So <laughs> lots of tea and cake were had. And this is lovely view. This is a garden center, y'all. And this is their display garden to show what's going to, what you could get in the garden. Um, but this was at Glen Doik, uh, which I do recommend. It's kind of off the beaten path in the middle of nowhere. And, and Hannah had taken me up to hold her plant press, which is what I did a lot of times. She was doing pressings of rhododendrons. And, um, and, she, and we were driving, and I was like, Hannah, where is this place? And we just like turn off in this little building, in this little tiny driveway, a little parking lot. And we go to the little tea room, we have our tea. And then there's this behind it. And I'm like, oh my god. Um, this is June at Glen Doik. Um, and you can just walk up here, you know, the lovely um, horse chestnut and just all of these roadies. And she's, she's talking to one of her friends there, but I'm going, oh my God. Rachel, uh, Rachel was another friend of mine. We were just going, oh my goodness. Um, and then the Mykonopsis. I know that if anybody has Instagram or Facebook or, you know, picks up a newspaper, you see that the blue poppies are in flower around the horticultural world. And they really are something else. Um, I didn't realize how hard they were to grow, even in, in Scotland. It really, does, it really is an art. And um, Hannah was even impressed with this. And I was like, oh, well, it's a, just a bed. She's like, no, this is really, really amazing. The other amazing plant in this picture, though, is um, a cardiocrinum. They call it a cardiocrinum because your heart stops every time you see it in flower. Um, it, it gets about, it, it, they get as tall as the lights here. They're pretty wow. impressive. But we just kept walking through this garden and just picked these, these, the colors of these plants. It was just amazing. The, the light was perfect. And Rachel was like, look, this one's huge, this one's huge. Um, and it was. These, these were a little bit bigger than um, we'd seen them down in Edinburgh. 
Um, this is um, a, a oh man, I practiced before I came, rhododendron cyano, cyano giganteum. Um, yeah, so the flower heads are this big, the leaves are this long. I measured so I could show people how big they were. <laughs> cyano giganteum. Um, I wanted one of those. But Hannah was like, no, we gotta go get our plant pressings. And I'm like, but Hannah, look at all the stuff. Um, so I get all of her, all of our botanical stuff ready to, to, to take and you know, she gets her cuttings and she's taking her measurements and I'm making sure that her plants are being pressed properly. Um, and she's taking, she actually was also taking DNA because eventually the, the goal is to actually be able to map all of the rhododendron species. Um, this is a huge deal because rhododendron is, uh, which includes broadleaf evergreen rhododendrons and our deciduous azaleas, as well as the evergreen azaleas, all that's in one genus. There's like 1,200 species. They are, they are across the globe. So we need some way to figure out what, what are the evolutionary patterns. And one way to do that is using DNA. And so she was collecting some of the first bits of, of DNA for that. But she could also get really excited about this uh, rhododendrons too, um, which was really, which was really exciting to see. We could, we could pretty much mirror it out. Ooh, such as this one. Oh, look, there was just like a little stripe of pink right there. And then we got to go behind the scenes, which I was like, this is not behind the scenes. Look at all of this. And these are this this garden center. This is still a garden center, though. This this is crazy. They were doing all this trial work to develop dwarf, dark-leafed, dark-flowered roadies, um, and it got pretty darn close. Um, I was like, I did bring my pruners. Do you think they'd mind? I think they'd mind. Um, but they, they probably would have minded. Uh, so I did follow her around the country, and, and Glasgow Botanic Garden, is a 45 minute train ride away from Edinburgh, which is, if you go to Scotland, please take the train anywhere. A train ride in Scotland is beautiful. Somebody else does the driving. It's really comfortable and it's always on time. Done and done. Um, and they're always very conveniently located wherever the heck you're going. Um, and so today was a cactus event at Glasgow. There was also an orchid event too. Um, but I love the fact that in, in these countries, you see people outside, you see people walking their children, you see people just going outside to lay in the grass. Whether it's, you know, they take a day to do it or they do it in between work, you can always tell when people take their lunch breaks because there's suddenly this influx of people wanting to sit in the lawn. And this is lovely. So inside, this is one of the old glass frame houses in Edinburgh, at, at Glasgow. It was, it's not nearly as diverse or impressive as Edinburgh, I'm not gonna lie, but they still do an amazing job because it's not as old a little bit more industrial. And it was kind of funny to see people growing gardenias in a greenhouse. I was like, it was a little tiny clay pot. And I'm like, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> and I have people, people have, my, my neighborhood, we have our 10 foot tall one, Thunbergiae's in full flower right now. And um, unfortunately, they have, have this really interesting glass out the house that looks like a UFO landed in the middle of the lawn. Um, huh? It's Victorian. It is Victorian, it's very Victorian. Practically UFOs. Um, they had killer plants in there. Oh my gosh! Mm -hmm. um, the, the, you would actually have to walk through doors to get into the different rooms of the glass house, which I thought was lovely. Um, and of course, they had this lovely uh, um, display of our native Saracenia. Uh, this was a complete novelty to them, and they had it in a very interesting, just on these tables and these raised beds, so people could like look at them and, and, um, at face level. And they were having an orchid show during the day, which was, which was really quite nice. This is, this is the entirety of Scotland. This is the Scottish Orchid Society having their annual orchid show. Stand back, y'all. Um, I, was, I was pleasantly amused. Um, if anybody's ever seen the pictures from the American Orchid Society's mm -hmm. annual flower show, it's really cute. <laughs> but this was one of the wedding plants, uh, which is a monkey-faced orchid, which I quite like. Um, and they had statuary in the lovely UFO center. They had these really weird green discs. Um, but this particular uh, lady did not look happy to be next to this plant. This plant smelled terrible. Um, and you can see on her face, it's permanently frozen in this terrible scowl. <laughs> it was, uh, this was also the first time I'd ever seen any South African plants. I've never been to Africa. 
It really, and the places that I go in the United States, not many people have South African plants on display, but in the UK, that is a huge staple to their horticultural offerings. Um, and I always thought it was funny, I, the trees never leafed out until like, like the end of May. <laughs> all, the, all the new leaf growth in the end of May. And uh, true blue rhodes, which was the first time I'd ever seen, I, there's really nothing quite like a blue rhododendron when you see it. Um, they probably thought I was nuts because I think I, I spent like 15 minutes with each time I saw one. Um, and more people just kept coming and coming, which was lovely. Chris, you're gonna have to keep me on time. Uh, so I did go to the Chelsea Flower Show because I'd be remiss if I didn't go. Um, and I didn't really know what, what to expect, honestly. Um, but you, you come in and it's just this influx of people. Um, you had to get tickets well in advance. Like there were people like asking for tickets. Um, and I got and when I got there, and um, I went during the 90th birthday party of um, her queen, her Majesty Queen. Um, but all of these huge flower displays, um, nothing like I've really ever seen down here in the South. I know that sometimes the Philadelphia, the, the, the Philadelphia Flower Show is designed the same way, but I had not been to that yet. yet. All this art, um, just this high level of horticulture and art. And I went inside this huge tent. I mean, the tent is enormous. I don't know how they got this thing up, but like each, they were, these were designed by sections, and this is just one section of, of eight sections. On the inside of the tent, that's not counting all the other stuff around. So if you're going to Chelsea, go to A, go, a, go to Chelsea, and then B, you're gonna have to be there a day. Bring snacks, bring water, food is expensive. Um, <laughs> But they have a displays for everybody. This was actually a, um, a community uh, school, uh, a two-year university school uh, display, which I thought was really lovely. Had a nice chat with them. <coughs> and the uh, Kevitt Gardens, which um, anybody who works with the Scottish Rock Garden Society, these people pretty much are the heart and soul of the Scottish Rock Garden Society. So you can see our lovely native trilliums here, um, and a couple of other lovely North American natives, as well as some alpine plants, which we don't get to enjoy very often. But just, I think um, Graham, who is a good friend of mine here, I think he said they had over 450 different plants in their display, mm -hmm. and their display was not even as big as this open space, so you could have spent the entire day just picking through what they had. Um, but everybody had just these incredible displays of different groups, the gladiolus alstroemeria, um, the chrysanthemums, of course, are very important. Um, and this year, they had act, they had named one for um, for the new baby at the time, and a, a place of high fashion. Uh, the student, the fashion students, had designed these interesting headdresses. Um, but also, the humble potato was represented here as well. Um, each one of these has <coughs> between um, seven and ten different potatoes on it. Um, and of course, a good representation of South African plants, which again, I still haven't quite figured out if I enjoy or just overwhelmed by. It's completely alien. Um, and I did get my picture with the queen. It was the one thing my grandmother <laughs> wanted from me. So I got my picture with the queen. Um, and I even got to meet my friend from Instagram. This is, this is I'm a millennial. I'm sorry, y'all. But I am a millennial. And I, had known, I have known this man for three and a half years. And we met at the Fel Chelsea Flower Show. He is now um, he is now the uh, the curator of orchids at uh, at the U.S. Botanic Garden. So um, and hydrangeas. Oh man, I love this hydrangea display so much. And the roses. Ah, ah, very very English. And then North American, which I've I've not seen. Saracenia look good in the United States, so uh, I have to give hats off to the British people who put this together. They did win a gold award for this. And they have, they have like three days to put these display downs and three days to put them, three days to take them down. So all of this was built in like three days. Um, and each night they have to go in and maintain them, put water on everything, switch plants out. So there's like a whole other version of this behind the scenes that they do. Um, and a coleokiti in the garden, which I was walking through and going, oh, hey, I know what that is, and nobody else knew. This is a diatom, y'all, um, wow. which I also got to learn about during when I did my master's. <laughs> um, they also have this lovely display. So the Chelsea Flower Show is actually a fundraiser um, for, um, for the hospital there. And so they had this display of, of the red poppies, which, of course, are very significant 
um, to remember World War I. Um, people lost in World War I and World War I veterans. And now, cute, let's run. Um, it was pretty, but it was a lot of walking. If you've ever, if you've not been to Q, it's a lot of walking. Long alleys, just trees, and each tree is different. So you spend a time going, oh hey, that's interesting, and oh hey, that's interesting, and you realize you've only got five trees in, and mm. you've got 20 trees to go for one of these one of these alleys. So you've got to move. Um, but that is the that is the beauty of that place. It is a walking garden. You have to. It's a meandering garden, and you need a day to see it. Um, it's really wonderful to see a kind of this retreat. So a really nice specimen. Um, and they're, they're, the garden um, is arranged, it's a, um, it's a systematic garden, it's arranged by family. So you have these big blocks of very of closely related plants, so you can see the different patterns. Um, and they had a Philadelphia's trial area, which I thought was lovely. That's a mock orange, so it's got a really lovely smell. And the Japanese garden, um, I was pleasantly surprised after having been in, in Mobile, Alabama, and where it's just like the capital of azaleas of the world, uh, to see is it humble azaleas down in uh, at Kew. Trained, trained properly. So more alleys, and then a terracaria. Has anybody ever seen a terra wing nut? Those, there's the flowers. All those. Well, actually, that's a flower. Stand back, y'all. That's one flower. Um, but this, these inflorescences are like a foot long, and just this tr this alley of trees covered in these lovely hanging inflorescences. And the tree walk, um, which you could just see back to London, but it's it's um, helps for to, for perspective, I believe, to see things from above. And then the taxodium, I was very excited to see a bald cypress. <laughs> it's nice to see things far away from home. So I was almost back, ah, and then I finally found the roadies. Still lots of walking, but if you ever see a roadie, you have to look at their buds. Um, these one, this one has stipitate hairs. There's a little bit of waxiness at the end, and they're black picture doesn't even represent it. But I was really going for the azaleas. So I was down in Mobile for a year and a half, and I was the curator there. So I was curating a collection of 1,200 different azaleas. So I was a super azalea nerd. I still am. Um, but they, we were always talking about the expiry hybrids. And these are these big trusses of North American natives. And they're kept here. And I was like, oh, I've got to see these. And I timed it perfectly. They were in perfect full flower. And it smelled amazing. Um, so these are all of, if you've ever bought, um, if you did look at the auction, all of um, Dr. Eugene Aromi's um, heat tolerant um, uh, azaleas are, uh, come from these, and that they did a really good job of breeding these large trusses and very <coughs> lovely scented flowers with really great bud colors. Oh man, y'all. And go pack. Yeah. Send this to NC State. Um, but remember, Q is, is really old, and they had turned the orangerie, which is where, of course, they kept all of their tropical fruits, into the, um, into the cafe. And they turned the old um, estate where the, um, where the royal family would stay when they visited Q um, into a museum, but they still kept the physic garden in the back. So this is, all, this is the kitchen garden and the physic garden where they used to go for food and medicine. They had a great a great um, interpretation display walking trail. I spent a lot of time there. Um, and this is one of the older parts of the garden. So the trees here were between 300, well, 100 and 300 years old, including this very old, I think it was almost 400 years, Stiff Melobium japonicum, which is one of the first trees from Japan that come to the UK. Um, it was bricked up and everything. Um, lots of very strange Himalayan plants as well, which is something we don't really do here. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't go see the um, the Queen, the Victoria lilies in their original house. Remember that um, uh, Queen Victoria had this glass house specifically built to house her Victoria lilies, um, and this is where they famously put the royal baby on there and got got their picture. Um, but this is the flower. It's very simple. <coughs> Very simple. And I loved how they had gourds hanging from the ceiling. Um, remember, these come, from, um, these come from South America, so all the plants here, it was, it was really clearly <coughs> done, a lot of <coughs> American plants to represent it. 
And finally, the glass house, which is all these amazing old, old, old specimens of um, travel from travels around the world. I can only imagine what the botanists thought when they were bringing all these plants back and had been in the jungle and brought pieces back and put them in here. And suddenly, everybody could see a little bit of what they had seen um, that no Western Western European person had ever seen before, um, including these lovely gingivers, pine cone gingers. And uh, of course, you have to see everything from the top. Uh, bless them. Can't imagine maintaining this greenhouse anymore. Um, but these palms, really, really, these were original palms uh, to the greenhouse, some of them. And of course, what the back was the older part. Chelsea. Was looking for it, couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. Google said it was here, and it's like, I don't see anything, a bunch of cars, and there's a guy standing there, there's some stuff over the hedge. But you do realize when you're in this country, there's stuff over everybody's walls. So it really wasn't indicative of anything. But then I saw this, and I'm like, I don't recognize that plant. Because as you're in the UK, you realize everybody kind of goes to the same garden center. It seems like, and not a lot of unusual things. And Hortus Botanicus Societis Pharmaceuticus, Pharmaceuticae, London. 1686. I'm like, okay, this is it. And it's a postage stamp. Chelsea, or, um, um, it, is a, it is a postage stamp, but it was lovely to see plants of the Azores, and I realized that's where, that's where a lot of people in the UK go to vacation. Um, they just hop on a flight, but these incredible plants, nothing like we'd ever seen. Echium, never seen an Echium. And again, systematic garden. Was a, systematics was a, was, um, something that was a European system, how to organize things. So everything is organized by family and order at the garden, which is really interesting, because you can see how things are related. Um, but it was a lovely time. Whoever their garden gardener was who was coming up with these lovely um, structures to hold plants up, I really want to take their class. Mm -hmm. So those of y'all who, who do weaving, come speak to me, I'd love to learn. Um, they had these lovely wagons here um, where you could learn about um, plants, but there was a lot of things about North America, which I was like, oh, that's where I'm from. <laughs> <laughs> then, of course, the fernery. Uh, you, you, could not, you can't go to a botanic garden in the UK without, you know, learning of the fern craze, of course. And you can't go and not hang out on park benches, lots of benches. So I went from London, which I realize I'm not a London person at all. It was nice to visit, but I was really, really, really glad to go back up to, to Scotland. Um, Scotland is a much wilder, more barren place, but you, everything is in the grass. It's all in the grass and the ferns and the mosses. Just like this Primula vulgaris, which I almost stepped on when I went to, um, to the Isle of Mull to see Staffa and uh, uh, the Giants. Um, so this is the, the lovely port town of Tobermory on the Isle of Mull. Um, this is a beautiful hiking trail that I was on, somehow discovered, I don't know, but it's an adorable town and a lovely little cafe there. And I had gone to see the Puppins, uh, which I highly recommend. It's worth the two hour ride, boat ride around the island to, to see these little guys. They are so just proper and well behaved <laughs> and, and very polite. Um, and understanding, and there's hundreds of thousands of them on these rocks, and they're so tame that, I, I mean, the boat let us off like right here, and these people for three hours did not move. They just took every single picture that they possibly could of these birds, just going about their lives. Um, and I was like, I'm gonna go see some plants. And, and this, this is the heart rock. All of those little dots there, all of those are birds. And the cacophony, there's a true cacophony. Is, is something to, to hear. Um, they call it the heart rock because there are all these little caverns within it that all of these birds live within. Um, they come up here and this is where they summer over. And the other part of the tour was of course to see Staffa, um, which of course, um, the history of Scotland, the, the geographic history of Scotland is old. It's a very old place in the world. It's 300 and some odd million years old. And a lot of the coastlines, you can see fossils of, of ancient oceans, 300 million years old. Um, and this was volcanic. So the western part of Scotland is all volcanic. So we've got these really old, weird rocks coming out um, that weather differently in the ocean <coughs> air. And so these 
um, is a silicon-based uh, uh, mineral that, that quickly cooled when it came up in one little crag in the, uh, in the crust, and here we are. Wow. Look at that. What, what had happened? I mean, I can't even imagine what this place was like. It, it must have been very loud, uh, very quickly. Um, and I spent a lot of time on the Isle of Iona. Um, so the Isle of Mull is where my clan is from, the McLean clan's castle is there. And I remember going there as a child um, when my grandmother took me, and I loved it out there. Um, it was so peaceful and so quiet, and there was not a lot of people out there. So it's like going to a little tiny town and everybody knows you, and unfortunately the bus drivers got to know me really well because I took a lot of public transport. But the island is almost completely this lovely um, granite, and they used to make granite countertops out of them. Um, thankfully, they realized, oh, if we keep it up at this rate, we're not going to have any island left, so they stopped. Um, so you still get these remnants of this, um, this granite, but the, the, um, the ferry from Finnefort uh, to uh, to the Isle of Iona. This is the entire island, almost. There's a little bit right here that, that, that's cut off, but that's the entire island. And it's a whole whopping 10 minute ferry to, to the island. Um, and uh, that's, the, that's the highest place on the island, 110 meters. And, um, and there is the Abbey of Iona, uh, which is where the famed St. Columba uh, wrote the beginnings of the Book of Kells, which of course eventually made it over to Scotland. It was supposedly started here before the Vikings got here. Um, but it's, it's a little fishing town. Uh, so this is the nunnery side. Um, and, but what's lovely is these, these little ferns that come up in the crags of the mortar that was, this is 1200 y'all, so the mortar is still holding and these ferns are holding on. Um, splenium. And these, this is a graveyard. Not, I, my grandmother is a historian, so I grew up going to Civil War um, graveyards and looking at the gravestone and going, ooh, that one's got lots of cool lichen on it. Cool. Um, <laughs> but these ones I actually spent a little time trying to read, and some of them are so worn that they, you can't read them. But they're worn in a different way than any other graveyard that you've been in, to in the United States, and that some of them are just mounds, and they're mounds in a way that they're supposedly um, more than a thousand years old. These old kings of the Isles are buried in this place. Um, so it's really, it's got a different feel than anything you can ever get in this country. Um, they also have a very nice uh, right to wander law. So this is into somebody's sheep pasture. And it just says if the gates open, leave it open. If the gates close, close it behind you. Okay, cool, let me do that. Don't mess with the sheep. They're not nice. <laughs> Don't mess with the cows. They're not nice either. Um, this is the golf course slash cow field slash sheep field um, slash they can occasionally land a, a plane here if they needed to. Um, and this is the, uh, the the walk to the Bay of Angels. And within it is this there's this cute little tiny grass um, parasite called Euphrasia. Um, and throughout this field are just Billions and millions of these little tiny things, uh, or Banchasey. But most of the, the diversity of Scotland is seen in the lichens and the ferns and the mosses. Um, this is chemical warfare in slow motion, y'all. And uh, lots of glacial till. Uh, all these rocks are different. I have lots of rocks that I brought back with me. Um, but I love going through and looking at, um, at all of them. Each one is unique. Uh, and uh, you can still see a lot of that granite in there, but there's some other stuff. I always call these the whale rocks. These are like pure white granite smooth rocks. Uh, so, so if anybody's ever heard of St. Columba, if you have not, I, I highly recommend Googling him. He's a very interesting um, uh, Christian, early Christian um, bishop. Uh, he, he, there are a lot of legends about him because he wasn't really, um, he was so famous, everybody made everything up about him. He was the greatest at everything. But there's a walk. Um, he used to take a pilgrimage to Iona to, um, to have solace, to find solace, and to, to reflect um, on his teachings. And one day I went, I decided to find the Bay of Columba. And I walk up this trail, and all these people go past me. And then I suddenly realize I'm like alone in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Nobody knows I'm here. 
And then I look around me and all of this heather is in full flower. Um, and uh, this uh, uh, hanging uh, lake is where all the water for the city comes from, or the town comes from. Um, but it's always, always there. Um, never runs out of water. And um, there goes the path just off through the heather. And then down. I'm like, oh, this is a lovely walk. And then it goes down. And I'm like, how do you get down there? Um, I realize it's quite a steep steep drop, but you come out on this lovely, this, this field, just it drops, and then this field of grass, and then it just runs up to this field of rocks, and then those hills start back, and then the sheep, of course. Mm -hmm. um, people, uh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of spiritual retreats to the Isle of Iona, and people go out there to, um, to meditate, they go out there to pray, they go out there to um, sit, they go out there to try to bring a sheep back in. Um, but there's all these rocks that sometimes end up in designs. Um, and people, you almost always find a new labyrinth out there. And there's a huge spiritual movement in Scotland. So uh, there's a lot of people talking about building labyrinths in public places. And uh, St. Columbus Bay is one of those places. But it slopes down to um, the North Sea. And just hearing the waves crash on rocks, if you've ever been to um, uh, Martha's Vineyard or anywhere in the Northeast, if you go to those coastal areas where the, the beaches are rocks, that sound is very, very calm and peaceful. And uh, lots of cairns, lots of stacked rocks. And uh, so I mentioned the spiritual retreats, right? <laughs> so when I, go to, when I went to Iona, I would um, always stay at, um, on, the, on the Isle of Mull at this little hostel, which is what you do when you travel in Scotland. Even anybody can stay in a hostel. I met this really interesting 80-year-old man who played a guitar who rushed me to a train station once there. But anyways, I'm staying at this hostel and this lovely group of ladies from Durham, um, they go, well, what are you doing? You know, and I have a lovely conversation with them and they're like, you have to come visit us in Durham. And I'm like, that'd be kind of cool. I, I know Durham. And um, so it'd be kind of cool to say I've been into Durham and Durham. And uh, they whisk me away, and this is uh, Miss Mary and all of her gardening friends. And she's like, oh, she tells the entire group of them that I'm coming. Mm -hmm. And, is that rain? Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Again. Again. Uh, she tells everybody that I'm coming, and they take me to the cathedral, they take me to the botanic garden, they take me to the abbey, they take me to their friend's backyard to show, everybody shows, wants to show me their garden. So this is the group of them picking gooseberries in the backyard for breakfast as we have tea on the back veranda. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Um, but you know, you always hear the stories of um, the coal mining country in England. These are the coal steam hills. So all of them had stories of their dads and their husbands going into the mines, um, which I thought was really interesting. So I didn't really learn a lot about that when I was in school. And. Uh, Oh man, y'all, sea hollies. Um, Miss Mary is not a very, uh, she's about this tall, but these were still some very large sea hollies, and it's one of my favorite plants. Um, this church was built in 600. They're not quite sure why it was built, because it wasn't a Christian church, because Christianity had not made it up to Durham, or up to, ooh, Durham is in Northumberland, had not made it up to Northumberland, so it's a really curious building. Um, and there's lots of really weird um, writings on the uh, tombstones. Some of them are just pictures. They don't even have names on them. And the Abbey, uh, which is really a prince, but she, um, she took me right in and said, you have to see all of these things. I had met these ladies once. Um, <laughs> just by really quite funny. And she let me stay at her house while I was there. I don't know, you know, I think back on these things and I'm like, I just got on a train to visit some lady I met once in a hostel in the north, in the, the highlands of Scotland. And I'm trusting that she's gonna let me stay at her house. And she fed me and drove me everywhere. But this was her garden. And it was the most classic English garden. It was, you know, every, all these little islands and, and trails and, you know, she showed me every single plant in place. And then of course you get to the back 40 and it just opens up into horse pasture. It's this little island um, in a sea of horse pasture and coal seams. 
And she says, sometime, next time you come, you have to come for, um, you have to come for the Lunasta um, uh, bonfire. Um, so her community still um, has a, a harvest festival bonfire, <coughs> which is, hmm, the, they were so lovely. And she was very silly. <laughs> I hope she gets to come visit me sometime, because she would really love this. And if you ever go, y'all need to go to the Durham Cathedral. So it was one of the only places that did not get destroyed during the, or, um, to the, during the Reformation. It's on an island in the middle of a, in, in the middle of two rivers. And it's completely fortified, and the prince, the prince bishop, said, "Oh, you're not coming up here and destroying my stuff." And so there's a lot of um, a lot of the history is still preserved here. It wasn't gutted. I drank a lot of whiskey. I'm sure y'all noticed that I brought my whiskey with me. I am a bit of a whiskey connoisseur. I do drink single malt scotch. I like it. Um, I am a McLean, so I grew up drinking scotch with my family, because that's what you do. And um, since Hannah and I had graduated, we were very proud of ourselves, and so we took ourselves on a Speyside whiskey camping trip <laughs> for three days. So we drove up to, um, to the Dalwhinnie, Anybody knows the Dalwini? Uh, it's the the highest altitude um, distillery in Scotland. Uh, we got there at the end of the day and got our tour. Had our whiskey, bought a bottle, and then we ended up in um, in a Glenmore, staying at a campground. And this is the Scots Pines, one of the one of the last places where Scots Pines exist. So we talk a lot about the longleaf pine savannas. They had a very similar ecosystem in Scotland, which um, did, did grow up or um, evolve with fire. In these places, the fire's been um, suppressed, and so you get this really weird ecology. We could not have a fire, which we didn't realize until we had a fire <laughs> for two days. And they said, hey, have you been burning? And we're like, uh, yeah. We didn't see anything, but it looked like a fairy wonderland, you know? We were walking in the woods and we found that. When you see that in the middle of the woods with all the moss, it's it's really hard to to not believe in fairy tales. Um, you definitely understand where they come from. And we uh, we also went to see the um, the pick stone or the the, the stones. Um, these are uh, stones left behind by the Picts, which are not the Celts. Um, I'm I'm listening to a, a lecture series on the Celts, and I highly recommend it if anybody wants to know how to get access to it. Totally recommend it. But these were um, uh, the standing stones, and these were preserved in a church. And they just left these doors open so anybody could come see them, but kept them out of the rain and out of the elements. Um, we stayed in this campground. So I showed a picture of the Glen Limit. Uh, we stayed in Aberlour, this one, uh, in this little campground. And we noticed that like these trees were in lines. Um, and we were setting up our, our tent. and. Uh, we saw this cute house in this line, and we had driven by a, a big manor house, which was back here. And come to find out, we were talking to the lady who owned the campground, and she's like, oh, that was the gardener's cottage. And I was like, we looked at each other, and we said, we could be gardeners here. That. You could take that room, I'll take that room, it'd be fine, right? Um, but we got there, and this was like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. This is June in Scotland, so the sun doesn't go down until like 10.30. And we're like, we've got plenty of time. Let's go over the hill, go to Glenlivet, go to Glenfiddich, and we'll hike back. <laughs> so we do. And we just go, you know, cross the street. We're like, it's if we follow this road, and we go up that way, we'll get there. And uh, we came through this forestry project, and we come over the hills, and this redness is all the rowan berries in full fruit, in full color. And all of the heather is just coming into flower. And this. I didn't realize at the time, but I had gone back and done some research. This is a critically endangered species of Erica, um, or Kalina, it's one of the heathers. Um, critically endangered, it's only found in a couple different spots in Scotland. This was one of them. It was a full flower at that time. And uh, we were trying to make it to the distilleries before they closed, which they closed at five. And we found this field of blueberries, um, which I know you can all see them right there, right? Um, <laughs> But we ended up picking blueberries for a while so we could make a blueberry crumble, which is, of course, what you do when you go to go camping with a lady from Yorkshire. Um, so we ended up at the, we only ended up going to the Glenfiddich uh, and uh, had our lunch. <laughs> and, uh, it, 
it made it part of the way back. <laughs> we couldn't ride our bikes, so we made it part of the way back. Um, and the next morning, uh, on the Sunday of all things, I was like, man, I'm from the, South, I'm from the South in the United States. If they heard I was going to a distillery on, in, on Sunday, I'd get strung up. Um, but it was our favorite. We really liked the space side. We liked the, the sherry caps, which this one, this particular distillery is known for. And uh, the lovely tasting. Um, not only did they let us try all of their, their um, different styles, but they also let us try uh, their um, their, their original spirit. Um, and because we had consumed all of this whiskey, the distillery person, because we had rented bikes, looked at us and said, you're not riding those bikes, are you? And we went, uh, no. And Hannah goes, I really need to eat something so I can sober up. So we go up the way, and we go find this waterfall and have lunch so we can ride our bikes to the next distillery. <laughs> We weren't that drunk, it's just illegal. <laughs> um, so we go down the Speyside Way, which if anybody has ever heard of that or if you hadn't, this is a great way to travel this area. And about six miles, we go down this little tract. Um, this is a uh, one of the old um, uh, sequoias. It's sequoia from the west coast. Um, apparently, we had stumbled upon an old manor house property. But all these lovely, these, these, these little thin paths, just wide enough for us to get our bikes down all these birches. Um, just fluttering in the wind in the afternoon. And this is the Spey River. So this is why the whiskey tastes so good. The water comes from the river. And it's very clear, and we could have drank it. It's, it is really quite nice. In Scotland, they are very strict about water quality. I was up on a mountain one time. I mean, I had hiked up this mountain, but there was an access road for the forestry project. And I'm like almost to this waterfall, and all of a sudden I hear this, this roar. There is a truck coming up behind me and it's a guy from the, the Scottish government coming to test the water quality two-thirds of the way up the mountain. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> but it's important. Um, so we ended up at Cardu, which is at the top of a mountain. This was important to us because uh, Cardu uh, was the first uh, distillery to be owned by a woman. She actually inherited it from her husband, who died. And when the local guys came to get it from her, because of course a woman couldn't run a distillery, she, had to, she said, oh, no, 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 it's mine. My name's on it. And she's kept it ever since. And so if you know Johnny Walker, Cardew is the heart of Johnny Walker. And we rode back. This area, this is, a, this is an old train station. Um, whiskey was so important at one point. They had a, whis they had a train station to the distillery area for all the men to get on and off the train to go home. Um, what am I looking at, Chris? What time-wise? What time-wise. You're on 209 of 270, mm -hmm. and it's 832. Okay. 15 more minutes, y'all? Yeah. Can we do it? Yes. Okay. So, like I said, we had gone to Glenmore, uh, which is in um, the northeast of Scotland. And uh, so here I am back again, and, and silly me, I don't know what I was thinking, but I'd gone in December, because it was beautiful. I was like, I want to go see some snow. You know, I'm from, you know, North Carolina. We don't really see snow. We don't have access to snow. Um, and I'm like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go up there and see this. And this, so this was a train ride to the Cairngorms. And I was like, oh, yes, I timed this perfectly. And uh, come into this cute, adorable train station. And uh, it, it, they still have a steam train that runs back and forth between these two towns that comes into this. So the kids like catch it every, you know, every Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got off the train. I got there in time to go hiking. But I realized I'm like, it's three. It's 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 like 1:30 in the afternoon. I'm like, it's getting dark. But I've got time, you know. So I, I take this little trail just by the hostel, um, and I hike up, and I'm looking at all this frozen lichen. The lichens are still growing. They're still green, happy as Larry um, growing, and the, the birches, um, you really get to appreciate birch bark in the snow. Classic view. And uh, it's actually starting to get warmer, which I noticed in all my like snow gear. I was like so ready for snow. And um, this is actually the breath coming off of the snow um, as the, the air warmed. Mm. And I get to the top, um, and this, this um, lady from England had seen me as I was walking up and she was like, hey, you're looking really warm. I think you're wearing the wrong underlayer. And I was like, I think you're right. 
Um, but this is the level at which these people are at. They're like, they know they can diagnose clothes just by like, <laughs> the condition you're in. Um, and you get to the top, and of course, you've got your care. And, but I'm like, man, it is really getting dark. And I see this cloud, I'm like, oh crap, I'm at the top of this mountain, it's snow. And I realize I can't see what's underneath the snow. And I go, this could be really dangerous. Um, it's because I start seeing these rocks popping up, and this is again like it, just you know, chemical warfare in slow motion. But I see this view of the valley, all of that. I come on the train that way. It was amazing. So the next day I get up and I'm like, I want to go see the Glen. And so I took a, a bus to, to Nethy Bridge to explore Abernethy. And um, Historic Scotland and um, and the Scottish government do a really wonderful job of, of trying to promote um, travel and, and um, visitation, and they have great maps of different trails, and they want, they have this um, uh, trail system throughout the country, so you can go, you can walk from any point in the country safely. And I wanted to see the Scots Pines, um, because I, I love longleaf pines. I, I grew up in the south, so pines are a huge part. Um, and so I'm going to go see these forests. And then I start seeing these, these structures. It's like, oh man, I'm in fairyland again. This could be good or it could be bad. Um, if you've ever read fairy tales, you, you know it can go either way. Um, and uh, I caught this one. This guy was like this big around. It's like, oh, here I am. I keep walking in the, into this rural area. Rural area and um, I'm about halfway through my day in retrospect, and I realize the light on this tree, I just got started, this light is wrong. I don't know why. And I realized later, the sun doesn't come up really high in December in Scotland. You're much farther north <laughs> than you are in North Carolina. And so my, my North Carolina skin and my North Carolina eyes were telling me, the sun is going down. The sun is going down. And the entire day, my body was like screaming at me, the sun is going down. And I just could not understand it until I was looking at this picture later. This is, um, this is the sun going down at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, so I find the public footpath back through the, the woods and um, the snow is melting and the, the, the trees just get this, this, the lichen on it opens up and the heather opens up. And there's still heather flowering in December, bless its heart. Um, and the entire footpath is just this view for ages, and it's so quiet, you can hear nothing. Um, it's very, very peaceful. I, I look like it, if you haven't noticed. Um, and I, I got there, I got there. Um, I also got to see uh, this plant, Juniperus communis. If y'all are gin drinkers, uh, this is the gin. This is the berry that makes the gin taste like gin. Finally, this is the last walk. Um, so I did a lot of walking while I was there. I did study, I promise. <laughs> I do have my master's. I can tell you more than you'd ever want to know about how, why asparagaceae is important and why the gentleman who's coming in October is actually kind of excited about aspidistras. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, one of the reasons why I had come back to Scotland is when I had gone as a child, we had gone to see the Isle of Mull and see Duart Castle where the Clan Maclean had come from. And you know, for people who have Scottish heritage and go to Scotland, it's, there's this feeling that you can't really put a, a finger on. And it's really distinctive. And uh, I still quite haven't figured out how to put it into words that are understandable. But there was this mountain, right? I'm on the ferry and you're looking at the castle which is like right here on this mountain which is right here. I'm like, I want to climb that thing. I want to climb that thing. So I did. Uh, so I'm walking up this path and I'm walking onto somebody's property. So as an American, you're like, oh my god, I'm walking onto somebody's place. Like, are they really going to shoot me? <laughs> um, guns are not really legal in Scotland. Uh, so that's lovely. And I come to this gate and it's a ladder. It's a 12 foot ladder to get over this gate. So I climb over the gate, and, um, stepping on these little bog plants. Um, there they are. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, the gorse is in flower. Uh, gorse smells like coconut oil. Mm -hmm. 
which is not something you really expect when you're climbing a barren mountain. It smells like coconut oil. Um, and uh, I finally turn around, and that's what I start to see. So there's Duart Castle, the seat of the Cloud McLean. That little bit right there is um, Oban, where the train would come into. Um, and I was got to the first cairn, and cairns are important. They kind of they're, they're place markers, um, really just significant as a hill walker and a hiker. You you just kind of get to know these, and they exist in the United States, I'm sure. If anybody's made to the top of the mountain, hikers for some reason like to pile things on top of stuff. I don't know what it is. They just do. Um, but I was like, I'm still not at the top. There it is. Um, but you don't ever really see this from the ferry. I'm like, wow, that is really incredible. <coughs> it's really hard to understand how deep that is. That's really high up. And um, this is a volcano. This is an old volcano, 300 million year old volcano just hanging out in Scotland. And then the road runs out. And I'm like, oh crap, OK. And then the road kind of bends. And I'm like, oh, I'm walking in the sky. This is kind of fun. Um, and we make it to the first power station. <laughs> There's two power stations. Um, and then, then the path just ends. And I go, well, where's the path? And then I see one kind of up the hill. I'm like, oh, OK, I'm going to go that way. And I come, I come around, and the path ends again. And I look up, and I'm like, oh, there's a path over there. So I find my way to that path. And, um, and then I realize, like, that is really far down. I wish my picture did it any justice. But that's like a yeah, thousand foot drop right there. And I'm like, oh, that's a long way down. And uh, I climb up this path. I get up there, because I know that it kind of keeps going, um, but I realize when I get to the top and I push myself over the other side, it was a deer path, <laughs> and the other side goes straight down. So I throw myself over and go, oh crap, and I'm laying in the moss, looking up, and I'm like, oh god, please don't slide down this mountain right now. <laughs> but I keep going, I keep going. Um, I come up over another ledge, and it's... I make sure it's safe before I throw myself on the other side of it. And um, I go around this really sketchy ledge. I won't even, I won't even show you a picture of that one, because that one was really sketchy. And I come to Scree, which um, if anybody's been to the, the garden, they've seen kind of those little, little pebbles in the crevice garden. Um, and uh, and it's, it's kind of emulating Scree, which is little tiny rocks at the tops of places. And uh, I realized suddenly that it is really shifty. You walk on that, it's like walking on gravel on a, on a slope. And I go, ooh, don't want to slide down this mountain. But thankfully the grass had like almost perfectly layered itself, kind of like a series of stairs. And uh, there was still snow at the top of thing, this thing in July. But I did make it. Uh, and this is the view to the interior of the Isle of Mull. And uh, that's, the, that's the path that I took all the way around the edge of this volcano. Um, and this really like drove it home for me. This is an old place, old, old place. Not just in the sense of the peoples who have been here for a very long time, but geologically speaking, this is an old volcano. Um, and this is what's left of it, even in the rain. Um, and this is looking out towards the highlands from the top of, of the uh, place. So with that in mind, I climbed down the mountain, and of course, I sent a letter to my grandmother. <laughs> this little mailbox is built into somebody's sheep hedgerow fence. And of course, the mail is picked up at 1 p.m. <laughs> so thank you all for so much for your time. On. Any questions? Does for anybody have any questions? How long did it take you to climb up there? Uh, six and a half hours to go up and down. Oh wow! wow. It was a six-mile hike. I didn't realize. Um, <laughs> I, I love how I go at things. I do some research. I do actually like research stuff before I go. I find out just enough information to not make it scary. That's what I found. Just enough to be not dangerous. <laughs> Are the rhododendrons over there as invasive? I know they're very invasive in Ireland. So there is one species, Rhododendron ponticum. It is from the Himalayas. Uh, they brought one back. There's, there's hundreds of species of broadleaf evergreen rhododendrons in Scotland, hundreds. But this one, for some reason, when they brought it in, 
by hybridizing with other species, the babies became fertile and they have taken over. And so yes, rhododendron ponticum and rhododendron ponticum babies mm -hmm. are, are invasive. And it's, it's a pretty nondescript um, plant, really. It looks like if you've ever been to the North Carolina mountains in June, you see the Catabiense and the Maximum in full flower. And that's kind of what it looks like, but it is a bit disconcerting when you see it on, in the highlands. But they, um, again, it's a small country, so they actually are really mobilized to fight invasive plants. And so they actually use their national guard to go in and do invasive plant removing, which I think is a lovely idea. Um, so if anybody is in the government and can put a good word in, you know, mobilize. This would be great. Yeah. Yes, Mom. Oh. Yeah, okay. Uh, another place where you left us and didn't tell us the rest oh. was on your December vacation trip when you hiked to the top of this mountain mm -hmm. and there was snow and there were exposed rocks and it was getting dark. What happened? Oh, what happened? <laughs> I didn't make it down. I made it down. Safe and sound. Um, yeah, it was it was a bit hairy because um, I got to the top and and it was and I realized the sun is going down and it this it was complete darkness by 4:15 <laughs> and. Um, and, uh, and I, I was like, okay, I really have to be much more mindful of the time. And I was soaked. I did not properly prepare for dealing with the snow. So I was really thankful the next day that the snow was melting because it just is kind of like in North Carolina where, you know, we get snow for like a day or two and then it gets hot enough, everything's gone. It's kind of how it is in Scotland, thankfully. <laughs> so the, the, the end of the story that I didn't tell you, so I left off at the juniper berry, right? I got lost. I got really lost. <laughs> um, I should have. I took a right when I should have taken a left. I had my map oriented wrong, and I realized about two miles down the road that I was lost. And the sun, of course, is going down, and I'm thinking, "Oh my God! Oh my God! Where am I? How am I going to get back? I've got to catch a train because if I don't catch that train, there's not another train that runs until tomorrow." I don't have the money to pay for that ticket because they won't honor that ticket because they're very strict about the trains. You buy one ticket, that's the only ticket you get. If you miss it, you missed it. Um, just to keep in mind. Um, <laughs> and I totally respect that. Uh, but this fluke, y'all, like I think about this and I'm like, man, the universe was really looking out for me. Um, I go by this nature center and there are still there's these birds of prey which are in the the highlands of Scotland, and birds of prey should not be in northern Scotland in the winter time, but they're there. And, um, and I'm like, I'm watching these birds over this frozen lake, and I'm like, this is, this is still very beautiful. I'm still appreciating the beauty. <laughs> and I come to this parking lot, and it was at the trailhead that I'd ended up on, and there was nobody in the parking lot except for um, this one car, which I see the couple, and they leave right as I see them, and I go, Shh. But I'm walking, the, the trail is really close to the road, and there's this, you would think only in the south you'd see this, but there's a man in the road, in, in one of those mobile chairs, going down the road in his mobile chair. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at this and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> you can't imagine this. And a car goes, kind of goes around him, and uh, pulls into the parking lot that I'm walking towards, and turns around and goes and checks on the man to make sure he's okay, and he's okay, and so he just keeps on going down the road. But the man turns back around, comes back into the parking lot, and he gets out of his car, and I'm like walking through the parking lot awkwardly, like I'm gonna keep going, and he kinda like meets my eye, and I go, good evening, and he goes, good evening, do you need a ride? And I'm like, as a matter of fact, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just I can't make that up. I'm not making this up. And um, and we spend the next 15 minutes going from where I'd ended up at, which was about six miles away from where I needed to be. We spend the entire time. He told me about all the times in the 70s when he and his friends would go hiking across the country. And he knew what, and he found out I was an American. So he was, yeah, I went to you know California to see all the the trees in California. And we used to be able to hitchhike all over the place. And people were always so kind, you know, to pick us up and take us to the next destination. And I always thought that if I ever had the opportunity to give somebody a ride, I would do it. And you're the first person I ever stopped to do that. 
And I said, well, sir, I was lost. So I am really thankful for that. And I just need to be dropped off at the train station. He says, well, I was glad I was here to help you. And I didn't miss my train. It was amazing. Anyways, any more questions? Okay, thank you all so much for coming back around.